Hello again. Well, that was a kind of a long session. Uh, we just had a session on dreams. So I think it, instead of doing it on chemicals and uh, in food and personal care products, we'll leave that for a future session. Let's just see if we can talk to Howard Hughes. Everybody, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people have wanted me to, us to bring him forward for a little chat. Okay. What do you think? Well, I've always known that he's to be an interesting person. So um, let's see what he has to say. Can you go fetch, Eric? How's it going? I got it, Mama. I know you do. You saying this is just as crazy as I am. <laughs> oh, no, it couldn't be. No. Okay. He's saying hello. <laughs> He's, Hello, Mr. He's Hughes. Flight. How are you flight. doing? How how was your afterlife going? Um, uh, good. He says good. Good. Uh, well, thank you so much for agreeing to let us learn a little bit about you, and from the spiritual wisdom you have surely gained from your life and your afterlife. Can you start out by telling us a little about a bit about your childhood and your relationship with your parents? I don't know very much. I know some things about you, but not that all that much. Um, well, let's just say that when it comes to my childhood, my childhood really shaped um, my entire life. Um, it was, um, let's just say that I was very adored by my mother. Um, she had a lot of fears, a lot of anxieties herself. Um, and she really would put those upon me. So she really um, was uh, the key factor to um, my OCD and my schizophrenia and all of that later on. Wait, wait, wait. Did she have OCD and schizophrenia? She did. So she did. Here, maybe it was a genetic thing that happened? Um, I think I, it's, it was... Let's just say that I was sensitive for it, um, but the way that she raised me um, really settled it in, into me. Really, so maybe activated the gene. Like, it activated it. Yeah, it activated. It. I, I I was uh, sensitive for it, um, but if I had had a normal upbringing, then I think um, you know there there might have been a different future for me. There might have been a different life for me. However, you know it. it she relationship between my mom and my dad he shows me was not really that present um it looks like they were always separated they were always doing things on their own and so mom really focused on me as the man in the house even from a very um very young age and and even went to a point where um sexual behavior was was introduced uh by my mother um you know as a very young child so how old i, I was four okay um well, when details. the touching when the touching and all of that okay. started so it was at a very young age um now my mom also was um had ocd and she was terrified of bacteria she was terrified of dust she was terrified of illnesses um so she would really put me in a bubble she would really protect me um she she was terrified that something would happen to me because I was the only person really present in her life. Um, so she would stop me from having friends. She would stop me from going out. She would stop me from going, going to camp. And so um, as I grew up, she introduced those ideas and those thoughts about the bacteria and that it wasn't, we didn't have the bacteria in us. It was always someone else or it came from outside of us. Um, so that's how I grew up with really those ideas, those twisted ideas um, of of what um, the outside world was really about. And it even came to a point where um, I was a very insecure child. I did have to go to school, but I did I wouldn't make any friends. I would really I was just a loner. I would always kind of go in my own little bubble in my own little world. Um, and 
because my dad was always away. He was always away. Um, Why? For work. Oh. He was always trying to succeed in life business-wise. Um, and so he was he was always connecting to people, trying to get new ideas out. Um, but he's saying, you know, because I never saw my dad or not as much as I would like to, I even got to a point where um, I, I, I shut down completely. Um, and oh. doctors would, it would look, I would be completely paralyzed and doctors would do research and they couldn't find anything wrong with me, but I couldn't move. I was wow. completely paralyzed. Now it had nothing to do with my body. It was completely 100% psychological. Yeah. And it, it also had a purpose because I wanted my dad to come back to us. I wanted my dad to be around and it did. It worked. <laughs> my dad stayed with us uh, for, a, for a while, he says. Um, and, and then I just suddenly got better. Um, so, it, you know, it got to that point where whenever stress or whenever um, discomfort um, arose in me, um, I would I would step away. It's like I would I would stop existing, and, and it started at that moment when I was a child. Did you get uh, out of body, kind of? Was it an out, no, out of body? No, no, it was it was fully it was fully a mental decision. Um, okay. You know, it, it it had nothing to do with um, with leaving my body. You know, I was fully present in that moment. My limbs would work, and it was just a way for me to get it to. All the uh, and okay. it's just a way, in some way or form, it's almost like um, like you don't want to participate in in the place that you're in right now, so yeah. you just kind of shut down. This is painful. Well, uh, you, your, your parents died. Fairly, your your parents died fairly young, from what what I understand. What did that? What effect did that have on you? That they died so relatively young. He's saying, yes, uh, my mom died when I was 16 um, during a surgery. So, again, that Great. disease, oh. doctors, and your mother dies on top of the, 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 the sick, uh, twisted idea that we have about germs and doctors and all of that didn't really help. Oh. And then two years later, my father passed away. So I was very young. I was about 18. Not, not yeah, about 18, he says. Um when they passed away but by that time my mind had already been shaped by my mother's doing um, in such a intense way that even their death um, my mother's death affected me but my father's death did not affect me in so much um, and I wanted to become independent and I wanted to um, really um, take control of my life because don't forget my whole life my mother was in control of it she made the decisions for me uh, I wasn't allowed to do this that you know everything was controlled by her thinking by her doing um, and so when they passed away in some way or form I felt a relief I felt a um, a freedom in it because I was now finally um, um, I was finally able to make the decisions myself. And so I did go for the company of my father, the company that my father had started, which was successful. Okay, um, wait, what did your father, was, sorry, what, oh. wait, sorry to interrupt. What did your father die of? Um, he's saying natural causes. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. So you went to work at your father's company. Yes, I became the owner of it. Um, it was actually in the hands of an uncle of mine. Um, because I wasn't 21 yet. I wasn't supposed to have it yet. Um, but I went to court and I fought it and I won. Okay. Uh, so um, for me, that was my first victory <laughs> in right. becoming an independent. Um, so that felt really good. Um, and it also gave me a boost that I am in control. You know, it's I'm really weird because most people who are coddled that much and protected from the world have this learned helplessness and they're incapable of functioning as an adult in, in the world but you remain self-empowered what the heck you know i did 
I did look up to my father, who was very independent and very strong and very um, sturdy in everything. So um, I got the, the strongness and the independence from him, but then I got the phobias and everything else oh, gotcha. from my mom. Okay. So it was a, a really nice blend, <laughs> he says, of positive and negative um, um, aspects of myself. So that's that's what my childhood was, was about. It was... It was um, it was a very controlling, a very twisted view and upbringing of uh, what the world is like and, and, and what the, the, the truth is about things, you know, okay. when you, yeah. Did you have a father figure? A healthy I, father figure. He, he was healthy. <laughs> However, he, the problem was he wasn't around a lot. Okay, but so you didn't have another father figure that was more a part of your life? Never. Okay. Now, you took flying lessons at the age of 14. Why did you decide to do that? Or did somebody just uh, encourage you to do it? I've always been very interested in mechanics. Mm -hmm. okay. I, and my so was my dad. My father, that really came from my dad's side. Okay. Uh, it was all about mechanics. It was all about construction of um, machines. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the thought of, of, of flying, it gave me a sense of um, freedom away from my mother. Um, oh. But it also gave me a sense of um, being in control of something mm -hmm. that is bigger than me. Wow, interesting. Okay, so you, you developed many aircraft. What was your favorite and why? Oh, he's going, I don't really have a favorite. I enjoyed making all of them, but the one that I am proud of um, is, I don't know which one or what it's called, but he calls it, it's the biggest airplane ever oh, built. Oh, the Spruce Grouse? Spruce Goose? Yes. Well, why? I mean, why did you build that? I mean, did you consider it a failure? I think it, it lifted off the air, the ground, and just went for a very short uh, stint and then came down again. Because nobody said it was possible to get that thing off the ground. <laughs> yeah, everybody said it wasn't whenever, possible. Whenever, whenever somebody told me it's not possible, you can't do it, then I would do it. Well, so did you really consider it a success? It went off the ground, didn't it? Yeah, but I mean, what does that do to further the the uh, to further aviation? Did it help? Uh, did did it give us if you or anybody else information on how to develop other aircraft uh, in a better way? Like yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So let me explain the reason why I am proud of it is because the materials that we used. Uh, and the way that it was built um, really gave uh, new ideas on how to make the airplanes lighter, mm. on how to make them more efficient. Um, and so uh, from this uh, model, um, let's just say that um, what you guys, your public, what? Public? He goes all over the place. <laughs> I don't like um, yeah, he's pacing around. He's very pacey. Um, it, public airlines is what he's calling it. Oh, I don't know okay. what he's, I think uh, what we're just us taking an airplane. Um, I think he's trying to say that it really um, changed the way that the airplanes were built. Oh, good. Uh, because now they're huge. Airplane, like the yeah, Dreamliner? Yeah, they're lighter. And so we can we can also um, transport a lot more products because uh, he says you know before all we could do was transport the people and the airplane was just heavy enough um, to go off you know just light enough yeah. but now we are transporting postal stuff and and you know there's sure. loads and loads of stuff that's being put into every commercial airliner with the people and that is you know that lightness of the way that they're built uh i i had a, a big part awesome. in that. i'm really why, proud of that why did you call it the spruce goose uh 
Um, it wasn't really me who called it. It was a, a combination of our team who just came up with a name. Okay. It doesn't really have, you know, a little bit. Because if you look at a goose, you know, when they go up, when you look at geese, they're pretty heavy. And so when they have to lift off, you know, they have to kind of blah, blah, blah. They're oh, like yeah. walking and trying to get up. Um, and so just that, but it doesn't really, it didn't really have that much meaning. But okay. Now, you had the way it goes up, she says. The way it goes up. Okay. You had many near fatal crashes in airplanes. Can you talk about that? Is it like you weren't that good of a pilot or what? I met my husband. He was my flight instructor, by the way. <laughs> and I could do some 45 degree turns and get into my own wake terminals. I was very good at that. It's just the landings that I wasn't looking at. Anyway, that's a whole other oh, It's so amazing that you're a pilot, you know. I've always well, wanted get, to I fly a plane. I, I did it all huh. my solo cross country. I just didn't do the check ride uh, with the examiner because he was such a lech. Every time I went upstairs, he'd look at my skirt. So anyway, uh -huh. that is also another story. But why? Why all these? Saying, he's feelings? saying that's what I would do with the ladies too, but let's not. Ooh, I bet you were a ladies' okay. man. All right, go ahead. Um, What was the question again? Uh, why did you have these so many near fatal airplane crashes? Oh, I mean, were you not a good pilot? No, he's saying no. It, it had nothing to do with the way that I uh, would maneuver an airplane around. However, I would push him to the limit, and it. my team would always say, "Don't do this. Don't do that. Just take it nice for a nice run. Take it for a nice spin." But I just couldn't do that. I just couldn't do the same bit. I needed to push it and see how fast could it go. You know, how much yeah. weight can it carry? I needed to always push it to the limits. And so in that way, you know, sure. I always got myself in trouble. But it, but it seems like after one or two of those, you would have kind of pulled the reins back a little bit on yourself. No, because um, being in control yeah. and yeah. in some way, you know, it – it made me feel like I was in control of my own destiny. Mm. Uh, that rush that you get uh, of playing with life and death, um, you know, uh, okay. it, it just gave me a rush. It gave me an adrenaline shock, and, and I was really an adrenaline junkie. Okay. Uh, All right. well, yeah. Why did you become so reclusive, and was that difficult for you? And why didn't you get treated? I mean, toward the end, you really became majorly uh, so, but... Oh no. There she is. Hello. Oh. Hi, Ethan. Hey, baby. Naked, baby. Uh oh. 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 <laughs> Mommy, come get Easton. Um, so why did I get so reclusive? Go see Mommy. Okay. Well, he said, I did that a couple of times in my life. Again, whenever the pressure came too much, whenever I felt like I was stuck, whenever I felt like um, there was too much pressure on the, from the outside on me, I would run. I would flee. I would hide. Yeah. Um, it was just my way of dealing with, uh, with uh, not being in control of a situation. Hey. Thank you, Arlene. She's Hi. rescuing us. <laughs> Um, so whenever I felt out of control of the situation or uh, out of control with what was going on, I would hide. And I would have these episodes where I would completely get off radar and, and lock myself in a room. Uh -huh. um, now, let me explain something to you. He says, you know, I al al always had the OCD because of my mom. Yeah. However, um, I did have a really bad crash where um, uh, doctors told me or told uh, the people around me I wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, my heart had shifted in a different place in my chest. Um, my whole body was broken. Um, and, and really, basically, they were waiting for me to die. Uh, however, I was such a stubborn person that I didn't die. But what it did do is it caused a lot of brain damage. Really? Uh, and so... If you combine your brain damage with OCD, then you have a really, really unstable person, you know. And so not only did I have the OCD that came worse and worse and worse over the years, the older I got, the worse it got. You know, it got to a point where um, where I was paranoid of 
productions of my movie. Wait, you were paranoid of what? It sort of you stroke. can't clear. What were you paranoid of? You of, of dust. Uh, dust. Of dust. Okay, got it. Yes, and the whole world is dust. So it was, you know, so I would shut down productions of, of movies or projects until they cleared the dust. So you can imagine what those people had to go through with me. Um, but the older I got, the worse it got. And when I got that last accident, um, schizophrenia and paranoia were added to it. Yeah. Due to the the hit, the blow to the head. I mean, I had skull fractures. I had, I mean, everything was fl inflamed, swollen, and broken. Um, like I said, the doctors thought they they gave me a week, <laughs> and then that was it. Uh, but I, I I made it through. But um, it increased that paranoia, and it increased. Um, schizophrenia I started seeing people that were in there I started seeing things that weren't there um, and so uh, I started to lock myself up more and more because I couldn't I didn't trust what I saw um, because people around me would say there's nobody there they would confirm to me that there was nobody there and so I knew that I was seeing things uh, and so I stopped trusting myself um, and so I started locking myself away more and more now um, there were a lot of people around me and I paid them a lot of money, um, you know, but they all just wanted to please me and keep me happy. But if you have a paranoid person with OCD and you are giving in to everything that that person is asking, then, then you're only asking for trouble. You're asking yeah. for an enhancement of the illness. Oh. Uh, and so uh, eventually I stopped allowing people into my room because they were carriers of illness they were carriers of diseases yes. where they went you know they and, come in with a biohazard suit right and because i didn't believe that it that that the bacteria or the illnesses came from me but they came from outside of me i would completely seal my room and stay in there for months and even t two years so although people um try to communicate to me eventually it was with little notes that they would shove under the door and that's how i would sign contracts and okay. make decisions but in the meantime because of my paranoia and because of my schizophrenia um i started I started not seeing clearly about myself either, and I really just started focusing on one thing at a time, um, just to keep my my attention away from the things that I thought I was seeing that might have not been there. That's so, scary. you know. Okay. Well, um, you were quite the inventor, having built the very first ham radio in Houston and the very first motorized bike in Houston. You have anything to say about that? So mechanically minded. Wow. I also invented the automatic bed. Really? What's an automatic bed? The beds that go up and down for the oh, patient. Oh, seriously? I did not know that. That is awesome. Yes, because he says when I was in that hospital for a long time trying to recover from that almost deadly accident, um, I needed to find a way to go up and down. Oh, so I invented a special bed for me. I'm the one who invented that. That's so uh, cool. Well, I invented a lot of things, she says, um, and and you know I'm 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 very proud of every single one of them. But the the, the thing I'm most proud of mm -hmm. um, is really uh, the medical institute oh. that I uh, founded, that I started, because um, because of my paranoia with illnesses, I really wanted doctors, scientists to find cures for everything. Um, and so I invested tons and tons of budget and money into this um, research facility um, for all these different illnesses. And so I like to think that I contributed to um, modern medicine today um, in, in uh, discovering where certain diseases came from, what the solution was, and so on. So, Well, why did you never get treated? Or maybe, maybe you did. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, people had hired doctors for me. Um, however, since I didn't allow them much in. Yeah. <laughs> But couldn't they have thrown some pills under the under the door? Well, after my accident, I did become um, addicted to codeine. Okay. 
Um, so I had a severe codeine addiction on top of it. So they, they kept me happy with the codeine, okay. but I didn't want them to touch me. But you, they were you not weren't on psychiatric drugs ever, or were you? No, just on codeine. Maybe they didn't have it back then. I don't know. What was your best business investment? He says, let me explain just a little bit. He says, uh, before you go on, um, why they never put me on any of that medication. Um, because they were benefiting very much from me not being all there uh, and them uh, being able to uh, make me sign uh, deals, oh. contracts, paychecks uh, while my mind wasn't uh, 100% there. Terrible. So let's just say that they, uh, they benefited from my, me not being uh, in my right mind mm -hmm. in a very profitable way. Now, what was your question? Your best business investment, just briefly. My best business investment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says my hotels. That way I didn't oh. have to move. Oh, awesome. Who was the love of your life? He's laughing, so I don't know if he's serious, but he's laughing. The love of my life. Uh, that would have to be Miss Hepburn. Uh, is it Catherine Hepburn? Or, or it must be Cat. Okay, wow. Kathy. Okay. He called her Kathy. Aww. She okay. was. She was. Just as crazy as I am she without was a Spitfire. All, without illnesses. Without illnesses. <laughs> yeah, she was a Spitfire. She accepted me. She accepted me with my illnesses. It did eventually become very hard for her um, to to live with um, the OCD and the paranoia and all of that. It did become very hard for her. So I do understand why she needed to move on. Um, however, she was the only person that I felt connected with. Well, did y'all have an intimate relationship? And did you ever get married? We had a very intimate relationship, um, but we never got married. Okay. Tell me about your relationship with Jean Tierney and what you did for her daughter. I think Jean Tierney is an actress, but I'm not sure. I think that's from a blog member. Jean Tierney. T-I-E-R-N-E-Y. J-E-N-E. If you don't want to say it, that's fine. And he's just, he's just shaking his head. It just feels like it's, it was just an exchange of, of, of resources is what he's saying. I'm not really sure what that means. Can you elaborate, Mr. Hughes? Well, Eric, you can jump in and help if you want. Yeah, it doesn't feel like there was any romantic um, involvement in it, but it feels like there was uh, an assistance of um, funds, is what they keep so, showing me, yeah. money, uh, in order to help a child. Okay. So now, you, really you struck and killed a pedestrian, Gabriel Meyer, in Los Angeles. They say you were sober, but some think you had been drinking. Were you, and what effect did that have on you? That's one of my biggest fears, running over somebody. Ugh. Yeah. Huh. He's saying it was a, was I sober? No. Um, was I on drugs? Yes. Um, had I been drinking? Yes. Okay. Did it affect me in any way? No. Wow. Why? Because in my world, the only person who was really important was me. Oh, man. That's harsh. All right, now some rumors, this is from a blog member, speculate Mr. H that Mr. Hughes went into hiding and was still alive for years after his quote-unquote death uh, or the degeneration of his mental state, uh, that the person who was Hughes in his apartment was indeed someone else and not him, like a replacement of some sorts, for he was some sort of secret spy or agent, and that he lived another life somewhere on a ranch or farm. May, may I ask this to be true or just another rumor? Did he really have those health and germ bubble? We know that. Okay. 
Like I had the germ phobia. Yes. Was that somebody else while I living while I was living somewhere else? No, that is uh, a rumor. Okay. What about your relationship with Jean Harlow? He also he or she also asks. And what? Jean Harlow. We keep falling out every now. Um, what was your relationship like with Jean Harlow? <laughs> Um, very loose is what he's saying. Um, Jean Harlow was a very talented actress. He's, he says um, that I am very proud that I introduced her to the world. Um, she was actually a replacement of another actress <laughs> because um, we started out making a non-talkie movie, and we turned it into a talkie movie, and the original actress, her voice had too much of an accent, so we had to replace her. Okay. So I found uh, Jean Harlow, and she was um, stunning and beautiful and um, articulate and really graceful. Um, and so did we... <laughs> Did we have some fun together? Yes, we did. Okay. Was it a serious relationship? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was more of a, a business relationship with benefits. So yeah, friends with benefits. Now you know you were a lot around a lot of just gorgeous actresses. Did you were you did you do what Harvey Weinstein is now being has allegedly done? Were you a, se a sexual predator that was like, hey, you have sex with me, or I'm going to put you on the blacklist, or things like that? No, I was not. However, um, you have to understand that in the Hollywood world back then, um, in order for you as an actress to um, – to get far into your career, you needed to have fundings and you need to have a powerful person behind you uh, who could buy you certain roles. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, that is the way it was in those days. So you pretty um, much so had to screw your way to the top sometimes. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And so when, you know, I was one of the richest men in the world. So whenever um, women would be invited to my parties, I would actually um, lurk them with jewelry. I would have platters of jewelry, real diamonds, and just have waiters walk around. And the actresses were allowed to just take whatever and just take it home. So um, it is, you know, it is uh, in some way or form seduction, um, lurking them uh, into your bed, but with... Um, with jewelry, with money, with um, the idea that I can provide anything for them. Okay, so you were a player. You weren't a sexual I predator. A player. <laughs> All right. Me, Bella, you're on my notes. Uh, was your OCD, did it have any spiritual significance? Well, it determined my whole life. Um, and, and, and basically... Um, the spiritual contract behind the OCD was to experience um, the best and the worst of me. I needed to experience the contrast between being on top of your game, being the best you can be, really um, um, experiencing all the, the, the power that you have, but also um, the, the creativity and the knowledge and the understanding, and then really experiencing that contrast. Um, so everything was linked to the, my whole life, um, my whole life's contract was linked to the OCD to experience um, OCD, but with, you know, functioning for you. Right, um, people it, with OCD get shit done. Yeah, it can, it can you know, end eventually if, if, if it's if it's not just the personality, OCD personality, but actually the illness, then yeah, it can get in the way. It can it can lift you up to a high, and then it can dr bring you down to okay. your low. And I my my mission or my contract or my journey on this earth was all about um, experiencing the contrast. Okay. Now, tell us about the end of your life. Did you have something called allovenia, this one blog member says, which is a painful response to things that shouldn't cause pain? And, um, yeah, and, and, okay, start out with that. 
Um, he's saying no. Well, what it was is I I was in constant pain, but it was um, because of the mental uh, condition and the you know the the codeine addiction. Um, whenever you try to reduce that, um, you know the pains would come back, and your body would say you need it, you need it. So oh, it's more more of that. And um, my death um, was caused by um, uh, several things: the codeine addiction combined with malnutrition, combined mm. with lack of hygiene. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit of everything. And my body had deteriorated yeah. to a point where uh, people would call uh, anorexic, where there were, it was just a skeleton that was left. So when your body is in that bad of a shape and your basically your organs are, are, are dissolving yeah. as we speak. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, so... So at the end, you didn't take baths. You stopped cutting your nails and hair for weeks and weeks. Because of because why? Yeah, because because well, because first of all, I wasn't going anywhere. Second of all, um, I was in such a distorted state in my mind that hygiene didn't even come into my mind. It wasn't even part of my life. Was your death peaceful? Um, it was long and painful. Mm. What was your transition itself like? Well, saying the one thing that I thought was was great about my ending is sorry, that the freaking fax machine, but we're expecting an important fax, so I could not unplug it. Go ahead. That's fine. Um, he says the one thing that I thought was was good. I always wanted to die in an airplane. Um, and so um, when they took me from my room, when I was in a coma, um, I was still in my body. I was still present, um, but I died in the air while they were transporting me. Wow. So um, in that aspect, I think, you know, I always wanted that to happen, not in the way that I was, of course, you know, um, but I wanted to go out in an airplane in the air, in the sky where I felt good. Um but when I transitioned, I think everything went pretty smoothly. In some way or form, I had been waiting for it. I, I was done with life. I really didn't want to be here anymore. Um, and it is really complicated to live a life, he says, where you feel alone and you hate it. But you still, at the same time, you can't seem to allow yourself to open the door to allow somebody in um, who, just because he might just have a bacteria on him or a dust speckle. Um, so you're in this constant state of confliction with yourself. Um, and um, I really went insane. I yeah, really, of course. I was no longer fully present in my body. Um, when it came to my senses, Did so in some way or form, I wanted it to end. I wanted it to stop. Did you believe in the afterlife when you were alive, or were you an atheist? Or um, I believed that there was something there, but what it was, um, I I believed that I was God. <laughs> oh no! Well, what did you believe would happen after you died? I actually flew, so, um, and I think that was just because I always imagined myself dying while flying. Um, so when I transitioned, I, I, I imagined, I remember, he says, floating over clouds. I felt so light, so peaceful. Um, I felt relieved. Um, and, I, and, and basically, I was flying. All I could see was, I couldn't see my body, but I could see clouds, and I was just flying above it. Um, that was how I, I transitioned, and, and then it, I eventually landed. <laughs> Where'd you uh, land? I landed in a very beautiful, bright place, um, and um, my family was there uh, to meet me, and, and there were other people there to meet me, uh, and Jean was there to meet me as well, because Jean died very young, um, and I, I did get affected by her death. It was a very... Um, painful death. Uh, and again, it was done by illness. It was done by doctors not doing their job, her illness being ignored. And, you know, uh, it affected me gravely. 
What was so, wrong with her? What'd she die from? Um, it looks like it had something to do with lungs. Okay. Um, so um, it feels like she, he's saying that she had been ill for a little bit and um, Oh, you froze. If you didn't go up. Uh-oh. Are you still there? Okay, no. I'm still there. So, it's okay. What, you have a, di a diagnosis for Jean's death? Or lung condition? It, it just feels like a, like a bronchitis kind of thing. Okay. What it feels like. I'm not really sure if that's what it was, but it feels like there was definitely something going on with the lungs. And, um, and you know, she didn't, she didn't get the... The treatment Probably that she care. needed, and um, and because he says, you know, the, she didn't want to miss out on the on a day of shooting of okay. the shooting movie because they would get punished for it. They would either get a fine, a very high fine, or they would really get punished for it and get crappy movie deals afterwards. You know, they were very um, very strict about that, and so during, she actually collapsed during while making a movie, um, and collapsed in the actor's arms and died. Wow. Uh, so it was it was an extremely um, yeah unforeseen death because she was only in her twenties. Oh my so. god! Maybe she 20s. had cystic fibrosis or something. All right, uh, was your death on the airplane? It wasn't an accident or murder, right? You just it was natural. Oh no, it was yeah. Okay. It, I did it to myself, people. Okay. Uh, no explanation. There, there was one more than one will found after your death. One was called the Mormon will. Which one was the correct one? The one that was eventually honored or not? Um, no, not that one, he says. Um, what What was the, was the one that was honored the real one, Will? No, no. Oh. However, um, I was constantly changing Will. Okay. Uh, whenever I had a flung in my head, I would change it. Um, when it came to the Mormon... Um, he's saying that I I had gotten to a point where I needed I needed to have faith in people and I needed to have faith in something uh, and it looks like there was a, a group of people um, who convinced him to hand over the responsibilities of the business and everything um, you know to them and, and basically although they would claim that decisions were made from him really they were the ones making the decisions i was just the one signing it um because i was not in the right state of mind i really wasn't sure what i was signing and i really didn't care anymore um, so um they basically controlled everything they made a will and i just signed it what is was that the mormon will yeah or, okay were they mormons why is it called the mormon will well um it was, it was kind of like a church, is what he's saying. Okay. Right. So uh, the, now they get the name the Mormon Mafia, is what he's right. saying. Jesus. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a, it was related to, to a church, he says. Okay, I just have a few more not questions. Not that I ever went to church, he says. Okay. Not that I ever went to church. All right, here's another one from uh, somebody. Howard Hughes' life was so complex, so many questions. I would like to know if he was always mentally ill or was made that way. Oh, we already did that one. Uh, yeah. uh, here's one. I'd like to know if Melvin Dumar was telling the truth that Howard Hughes left $156 million to him. Whoever that is. Um, he's saying yes. Okay. That is true. However, he never received it. Oh, that's so fair. Okay, um, now I'm just going to do my regular the spiritual impressions. They would always mix up the contract. Uh, you know, they would change. It was always changing, so. Okay. Uh, now we know what your spiritual mission was. and um, But were you here to, we know what you were here to learn through polarity, right? But what about to teach? Were you here to teach anything? Well, I was here to add to science and to add to inventing um, a new way of traveling in the sky. Um, Clearly. You know, it, it, was, it was a little bit of everything. You know, I think um, in some way or form, my OCD also 
um, created my brilliance. Yes. Um, and um, because I my my passion for anything that had to do with machinery uh, and 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 really. Um, anything that had to do with illnesses. <laughs> um, you know, I think I, I was here to just um, give um, those, the aviation part and the science part really an extra push uh, and really give them the tools to do the things that nobody else wanted to do, huh. you know. Um, also, when it came to the aviation, it was always um, the airline was, it was run or the, the sky was run by one, one company and they kind of had a, you know, a one-time thing for it. So um, I opened that uh, path for other airlines to become part of the sky. Oh, okay. So, right, so um, did you have yeah. any regrets? Um, yeah, I regret that I eventually created my own asylum and I retreated in it. Um, I do regret that um, I didn't allow people into my life anymore at the end. Um, I regret the feeling of, of abandonment and feeling alone because I was the one who created it. Um, but overall, uh, you know, a lot of people will look at my life and go, wow. You know, that was a crazy cuckoo. Um, but I think I, with my illness, I accomplished and achieved great things for the world. Uh, and, you know, I, I lived life to the fullest um, most of the time. Um, so I experienced everything and I had done everything. And um, I do see myself as, or my life as a success. I did too. Uh, I contributed to the world, mm -hmm. and I did succeed in in my own contract. So I think it was a very successful life. I agree. Uh, what after you crossed over, did you have any big insights? New insights? Um, yeah, I started to. You know, when it was about heaven and about God and, and, and all of that, I didn't really pay any attention to that during my lifetime. It just wasn't that important to me. Um, when I crossed over, uh, it was good to see or to feel. It's a little bit of both, he says, because when, when you cross over, you don't just see things, you feel things. It's mostly what you feel. Um, but it was good to see that um, that everything has a blueprint. I, I loved blueprints, and I loved to see how everything works and works together to a, a glorified unification. And I loved the the blueprints of everything and every person's life. You know, how one thing led to another thing, led to this, led to this, and everybody was pushed in a certain direction in order for not only that person to complete that contract, but also for um, that person to complete the contract in all of it, you know, yeah. uh, there's perfection and, and there is drive in every person's life. And just realizing that and seeing the connections, how this person's action controlled that person's behavior and so on, you know, and how it all comes to this beautiful, um, harmonious whole, um, for me was mind blowing. And I, yeah. Remember that was a really big highlight of, of understanding how the big, let's call it the machine of the universe, how it is so uh, oiled and and perfectly working together. Sounds like a mechanical engineer's dream epiphany. <laughs> All right, can you share a, another life that most influenced your one as uh, Howard Hughes? Um, yes, and um, if, this is a life uh, of abuse. However, um, this is uh, a life in the 12th century okay. um, where I was, um, he showed me how he was some kind of priest, um, and he would use and abuse um, young boys um, that... Um, would work with him or that would stay 
uh, in his facility is what he's showing me. So um, it was in some way the other side uh, uh -huh. um, of um, being on the other side, actually inflicting um, those fears and anxieties onto other people uh, and actually enjoying being in control of another human's Uh-oh, you froze again. Uh, Another uh, human's life, right? Yeah. Um, he's saying a lot of people will say, well, that was a horrible, very negative experience. Um, but it was all about... Um, being in control of another person. And um, although it is not done with love, <laughs> it was still a very satisfying life to, to have that perspective. Okay, real briefly, because we're getting all, I think the bandwidth, they're, they're throttling me down or something, yeah. fighter. So I just want to ask it really quickly. Can you share anything with us that no one else knows about, about you? Um, he's saying yes. While I was, well, I have a few things. Um, while the, most, the thing you think would most interest us. Well, while I was um, in my state of um, paranoia, while I was in my re um, excluded state, is what he calls it, um, he would start seeing his mother in front of him. Now, he says at the time, uh, she would always call for me. Um, she would always call for me. He says, um, she would call me Sunny. It was my nickname. Because my dad, my dad's uh, name was uh, also Howard, mm -hmm. and so in order to distinguish us, she would call me Sunny. Um, and at the time, I always thought that she was just, you know, she was an illusion. She was one of my paranoia, um, you know, apparitions that I would see. Yeah. Uh, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but. Um, but I, later when I crossed over, I found out that she really was there. And I was seeing a spirit uh, who was trying to help me because um, although she had given me this illness in some way, she had introduced it to me, um, when I would see her, she would tell me, uh, you know, that I needed to take a bath and I need to do yeah. this. And, and I would I would say, go away. You're not real. I would fight it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was really interesting to see later on that she was really there. Okay. And this was not one of my hallucinations. So it was mind blowing to me yeah. after seeing all those people who were never there. The one person who, you know, who was really there. Like I didn't mom. believe. Yeah. All right. So uh, two more things. Do you have any message or advice for us? And also then the last I want to see if Eric has anything to ask. Well, I just want to advise to people who are having a mental illness or who are um, having OCD or any kind of mental illness to not be afraid to talk to people about it because a lot of people will hide it for a very long time because they're ashamed of it, because they don't understand it themselves, because they're confused about it. So, um, allow people to help you and allow people um, in some way or form to guide you um, in this journey because I uh, blocked everyone out. Um, and if I had just, you know, allowed people to help me um, and to really listen to the people who really did care about me because the people who did care about me did talk to me about this. Uh, but I would, I would fire them. I would say, leave. I don't ever want to talk to you again. You know, I was in complete um, denial of what was going on. So um, listen to the people around you. Uh, allow yourself to ask help. Um, and don't ever think that you're less than anyone else. It is not because you have a mental illness that you don't matter Hi. or that you don't uh, fit in. There's always a room for a, a person, um, and there is always a purpose for that person. So okay. know that in this beautiful um, blueprint of a universe, 
that for every single one of you who is suffering from a mental illness, there is a purpose why you have it uh, and try and use it to help others. Try and be an example to others on how you can control it and live with it. Okay. What about you, Eric? Any questions? Uh, <laughs> he's saying, were there any, um, he's asking him if there were any women who turned him down because, you know, uh, he had so much money and so yeah. much wealth and, and uh, were there any women who said, no, no jewelry for me? Um, he's saying, yes, there were a few women who really didn't, um, who wanted to make uh, make their careers on their own and who were really um, not very flattered uh, with my attempts, he says. Um, Anybody in particular that we know? Yeah, he's showing me, well, what's her name? Elizabeth Taylor oh, turned okay. him down. Um, he, she, he had offered her a huge jewel for around her. Uh, he's showing me kind of like a, a roundish uh, diamond on a necklace. Mm -hmm. uh, and she actually turned him down and left. Okay. Uh, so, um, yes, not everybody. <laughs> that's funny. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Mr. Hughes, for what you contributed in, in, in life and also what you have contributed here. I really appreciate you. He said, thank you very much for listening to my story um, and for being an inspiration for everyone out there. Um, and I just want to thank Eric, he says, because the work that he does and how he helps people with bipolar disease, with OCD, um, uh, you guys don't see what he's doing behind the screen, what he's doing behind the curtain, but he is pulling and helping people to rise above their illness and to become greater than they ever thought they could be. So for that, I really want to appre uh, say thank you and I appreciate um, what a great uh, attribute he is to the universe. So, uh, Mama, he says, you should be very, very proud of I your book. I am so proud. Well, thank you so much, and thank you, Emma. You can contact Emma at www.emmanuelmacintosh.com. I'll put it up here. Anything else you want to share, Emma? Um, you can find me on uh, Learn It Live as well, learnitlive.com, and um, I'm not taking any appointments as of now. Uh, however, starting December 2017, I'll better put the date on there, um, uh, I am reopening my schedule. So feel free to give me an email uh, on uh, my website, emmanuelmacintosh.com, um, and I can try and get you guys in again. All right. Thank you. Bye, Eric. I love you. I love you too, Mama. Give everyone a hug for me, okay? Will do. Bye. Love ya. Mwah.